welcome again, everybody. I'm Bill Hopkins uh, from the uh, Cross Timbers chapter, president of the Cross Timbers chapter. And tonight we're really pleased to have with us Tim Siegmund. Uh, Tim leads the Texas Parks and Wildlife Private Lands and Habitat Program, whose goals are to provide advice and information to private landowners interested in the conservation and development of wildlife habitat on their property. Tim also serves as a member of the board of directors for the Native Prairies Association of Texas. And uh, tonight, Tim is gonna talk to us about how different plants can indicate the health of our prairies and land. Uh, some species are rarely found and only located in prairies that are healthy and at the peak of ecological succession. So uh, I think uh, Tim has a scoring method that uh, provides a tool for evaluating the land. Let's go ahead. All right. Well, thanks for having me out tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody. And uh, the presentation I'm gonna to give tonight, I gave a variation of it for our uh, TPWD diversity program here uh, back in, oh, December of 2021, and was invited by Catherine Stanley to speak with you all tonight. Um, about some of the same things. And really what I'm gonna talk about tonight is an evaluation tool that uh, myself and a couple other biologists from Texas Parks and Wildlife utilized uh, back in, I guess we started in the back in about 2015. Um, and what we did is to give, and this is what a lot of this presentation is gonna talk about is we wanted a methodology that was fast. We had no funding to do this. We were basically doing it on our own volition uh, and needed to do it in a short, quick amount of time. We wanted to do, wanted it to be effective at monitoring it. We didn't know how long uh, any of us would be in our positions, how long we'd be able to do this. So if something transitioned to somebody else, it needed to be re replicable. It needed to be uh, something that wasn't dependent some, some methodologies that folks use when they do uh, vegetation sampling rely on cover scores. So you can say zero to 5%, five to 10%, or a ranking system of zero to six, so uh, one to six. So one is zero to five, two is five to 25, three is 25 to 50, and, and or 26 to 50, and so on, all the way up to 100%. And that can be pretty subjective uh, because when you rank them that way, it's like, well, is it 49% or is it 51%? And you kind of got to make a judgment call on some of those things. And so uh, we came upon this floristic uh, quality assessment, FQA, or floristic quality inventory, based on some things we had seen uh, out of the Midwest, some folks out of Nebraska, some folks we had met through the uh, Grassland Restoration Network, uh, individuals with a patch burn, patch burn grazing uh, community of practice and those sorts of things. And so we wanted to see, we knew that there were a lot of remnant prairies and very small scattered patches and pieces, but usually not very large. And, and so effectively the Blackland prairie as an ecosystem was largely eliminated. Uh, so we didn't have a good reference plant community for a lot of these sites to know what we were managing for exactly or what should be expected. Uh, but what we did have is a lot of a lot of degraded habitat. So either brush encroachment from things like wheatsedge, elm, hackberries, eastern red cedar, or just a history of heavy continuous grazing where we had lost a lot of the climax grass species, uh, but perhaps a lot of the perennial forb species, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the uh, mid mid grasses, things like silver blue stem. Uh, composite drop seed, or even Texas winter grass uh, would show up uh, as a response and became more dominant than they would have been historically due to historic grazing practices over time. So we're like, is there any way we can shift this grazing pressure to come up with a different plant community or plant structure to favor what we would like to see? Since most wildlife species that we manage more, particularly birds, are responding more to habitat structure than they are to the species that are there. They're really re responding to the, um, you know, has it been three or five years since it's burned? Is it heavily disturbed? And you're getting a, a predominantly annual plant community and so on. And so what you see here in this picture is a, a little native prairie headed hay meadow. This is actually down in Washington County uh, in the Fayette Prairie. It's about a 20 acre uh, hay meadow remnant. 
So you see lots of, uh, oh, there's lots of uh, a little blue stem, uh, yellow Indian grass. Um, there's even some, uh, there's Indian paintbrush. There's also uh, purple Indian paintbrush, which is that's about as far as Southeast as you'll see it uh, on this little prairie. But the Blackland Prairie isn't the wide open prairies that you think about from like Nebraska, portions of Kansas, or even the Texas Panhandle or portions of the Texas Rolling Plains. They could be fairly large, few 5, 10, 15, 20,000 acres in size, but they were regularly bisected uh, by creek drainages that were heavily wooded. So you can kind of see in this photo, that's a, that line of trees is a tributary creek down to a larger creek system that's down here. And then these hills uh, were largely characterized by open grasslands with very little tree cover in them. Uh, and they were uh, almost always, uh, and except in some situations where you had glades or rock outcrops, um, treeless and dominated by tall grass prairie. So that kind of gives you a background about what we're going to talk about today. And as Bill mentioned, you know, uh, fill up that chat box with questions. I'll be happy to chat with you all as long as we can afterwards. Uh, but <clears throat> moving along here. So to give you an idea of the zone I'm talking about, you know, Bill saying he's out here in Palo Pinto County. Uh, most of this area where we did the sampling that I'm going to talk about was right here on the Navarro Ellis County line. So just southeast of the Dallas County area uh, near the community of Blooming Grove, uh, which is just east of I-35. Uh, have done a lot of work in that area for the last number of years with Jay Whiteside, uh, who I'll talk about more here later. But that zone extends all the way from the Red River, um, all the way down here into Bear County. You know, that's San Antonio. And there's two thinner belts of these same soil types. One, the San Antonio Prairie, not represented on this map, but stretching from about the Trinity River uh, here into Bastrop, and then the Fayette Prairie, which is this larger little inclusion within the uh, Post Oak Savanna that runs from about, oh, just east of uh, Navasota and Anderson and Grimes County, and even a little bit over almost into Huntsville and Walker County over there, all the way down to DeWitt County, Yoakum, Cuero, all that area down there. So a rich, uh, black, heavy clay soils, typically better than 85% clay content in that soil profile, very deep, very wet, and uh, hard for water to infiltrate when wet, uh, but then also can dry and crack and stick to your, uh, when it's wet, it sticks to your boots, but also can become dry uh, with huge cracks, you know, one, two inch wide cracks. Uh, during periods of drought, which is really hard on tree roots. And one of the reasons it stayed uh, open prairie is because of that shrink swell nature of that clay. These mainly vertisols, uh, which are a type of soil that is highly plastic uh, and has that shrink swell potential, which makes it really hard on foundations and other things. So I imagine somebody with all the development going on in these areas in Dallas, Collin County, Ellis County, uh, McLennan County around Waco, Williamson, Travis, Hayes, Somebody's gonna make a fortune on uh, foundation repair here <laughs> in the next few decades. But to give you a description of some of what was there, most of this has been lost. So John Brook, who was an English immigrant, wrote this description in 1848 up in Grayson County. So Grayson County uh, is up there in the uh, Northeast part of Dallas, Highway 75 goes up there. And so uh, he wrote, I can sit on my porch before my door and see miles of the most beautiful prairie interwoven with groves of timber, surpassing in my idea the beauties of the sea. Think of seeing attractive land on a slight incline covered with flowers and rich meadow grass for 12 to 20 miles. So a pretty picturesque bucolic setting he had there just about 100, and, that's about 173 years ago, 174 years ago. Another description, uh, and this is a, a book I recommend a lot of folks if you like, um, kind of uh, personal accounts and good writing. Frederick Law Olmsted, who's later the father of landscape architecture and the designer of Central Park, was sent down to report on uh, what was going on in Texas in the early 1850s. And so he took a steamer into uh, New Orleans, went to Nacogdoche, Louisiana, and then up to Nacogdoches, and basically took what is now today Highway 21 all the way from Nacogdoches down through Bastrop, and then all the way down to New Braunfels, and then all the way down to Piedras Negras on the uh, Rio Grande River, and then back to back across to the east, all the way to Houston, describing what he did and what he saw all along the way. So he was there just about eight years after the town of New Braunfels was founded. Um, he went through uh, what is now Caldwell, Bastrop, uh, Gonzalez, all those different places, you know, just 20, 30 years after the uh, Texas Revolution. Uh, and so 
this is in east of Centerville, Leon County, which is right along I-45, just south of the town of Buffalo, if you ever go between Dallas and Houston. And it says, during the first part of the day, we went over small, level, wet prairies, irregularly skirted by heavy timber with occasional isolated clumps and scattered bushes. Most of the prairies have been burned over. So here we're talking about the fire culture that used to be here, whether lightning strike, Native American set, early settlers set. Um, and so these prairies have been burned over during the winter season. He says, both yesterday and today, we have been surrounded by the glare of fires at night. The grass is coarse and reedy and exceedingly dry. We shot a few quail, which are pretty much gone from that area now, which are very common, and saw several times turkeys and wild geese. And then as he crossed the Brazos River near the modern day border of Brazos and Robertson County, so kind of between Bryan College Station and Hearn, uh, he said near the Navasoto, or the Navasota River, we rejoined the regular San Antonio Road and came out upon large open prairies with long and heavy skirts of timber. And this description applies to the whole region as far as the Colorado. The prairies, as you proceed westward, growing more and more extensive and the proportion of wooded land smaller. So he's talking about traveling the old El Camino Real, which is now Highway 21, uh, which is this little inclusion inside the post office of Savannah. And as he went further west, the prairies became more prominent and the trees faded out. <clears throat> so uh, in early 1856, here he was traveling. Uh, I think this was kind of got part of my screen hidden here for some reason. Don't know why that's not going up like it usually does. Um, there we go. Uh, but he's traveling from Seguin to Gonzales. So now here we are down on the southern end of the Blackland Prairie. And he says, today the genial sun warmed the fresh moistened soil and three or four more species opened into bloom. After this, hardly a day passed without some addition. And very soon it was impossible to welcome each newcomer. The whole prairies became radiant and delicious. The beauty of the spring prairies has never been and never will be expressed. It is inexpressible. I really like that phrase for our spring wildflowers here in Texas. It says a quick flush spread over all the bosom of old mother earth and seemed to swell with life. And another day, the elm buds were green and bursting in the wild plum and fragrant blossom. The dreary burnt prairies from repulsive black changed at once to vivid green. So here he's already noticing that these burned prairies are responding more quickly to the warm up of their soils and the, and the return to spring uh, than what he describes here in a second. It says, like that of a young wheat, the cheering effect I leave to be imagined. The herds all left the dry sedge, he's talking about the old unburned grass, and flocked to the new pastures. The unburnt districts covered with the thick mat of last year's growth were a month behind. And so that's something we see, and we'll get deeper into this as we talk more about the patch burn grazing. So looking at some of these images, it's some of the things that, you know, you may have seen in springtime, this is from May of 2021 on, in Navarro in Ellis County um, on, on a pasture that had been burned that January. So you can see some of the burn, how it had taken out some of these mots of sumac and uh, young hackberry over here. And now you've got a bunch of twin leaf senna, you've got a bunch of uh, uh, milkweed coming up here, blue bonnets. Uh, I think there was some foreigner daisy, uh, a lot of uh, dandelion, Oh, just a whole bunch of flowers, Coreopsis all through here, scattering through uh, and just bursting with wildflowers Some Gallardia up there, and just lots of green scattered through, lots of diversity. Uh, this is a look on the Southern Blackland Prairie, a little remnant that I came into. Also, this was in June of last year. So this thick bladed grass here is Florida past Balaam. This was mainly Florida past Balaam, little blue stem and Indian grass dominant. Uh, got some snow on the prairie here, uh, Euphorbia bicolor not marginated like you may see over in the rolling plains where some of y'all are at there in North Central Texas, but on the Blacklands, it's bicolor. So a good annual uh, form, get a little uh, latex on it that may irritate your skin for some folks, but then also you've got uh, Rattlesnake Master in here. And so a real high quality remnant prairie uh, in here that uh, just great grass production in here from, from these climax grasses, these big grasses. This is again in Ellis County on kind of a chalky limestone blackland remnant. So you've got some uh, different species of sensitive briar here. You've got large fruited or, you know, uh, Missouri primrose, so an author of macrocarpus. So it's got a really big pinwheel looking fruit, coreopsis, just lots of diversity. You know, you're looking at about a three foot by three foot area here. And there's, I think we added up like 16 different species. You can see Indian paintbrush, the Missouri primrose, little blue stem, um, this is that hay meadow. There's Jason Singhurst preaching to everybody about the value of these. 
And you can start to kind of see this clumpiness of the different species that are in here. So there's some Maximilian sunflower growing over here, over here, uh, some, I think, this, what do we have there? I think that's a thistle. Uh, there's lots of New Jersey tea, uh, colonies of Indian grass next to little blue stem. Next, there was even some gamma grass in this stand. You can see that clumpiness and that spread of these things across the prairie from those disturbances. Another look here, upright um, wine cup. There's some New Jersey tea again. Just lots of floral diversity, lots of grass diversity across these things. Here's mealy blue sage and twin leaf senna and thistles mixed in with lots of grass. This prairie is beginning to be encroached upon by cedars, uh, hackberries and elms. And so they're actually doing, trying to encourage more burning and have done about 1500 acres of brush control uh, that is planned. They've already done about 300 acres of that 1500 acres to, to restore this. Uh, and then you have these chalky ridge sites of the parent material and you can see like there's compass plant. Um, we got Hall's prairie clover here, which is a Texas endemic only found these barber buttons. So just lots of diversity. And a lot of these pictures I'm showing you aren't even 400 yards apart from one another. You got yucca growing there. Um, so there's some more uh, uh, wine cup, standing wine cup growing there. So just a lot of floral diversity. You got a bunch of liatris, uh, very gay feather, a blazing star uh, throughout. And then here, kind of that look of, of what the Southern Blackland Prairie may have looked like. We talked about those rolling hills with intersecting spurts of timber. This is it. So. This is another remnant um, there in Washington County, and that's big blue stem across. This is almost a 35 acre stand of, of what was probably 60% big blue stem here. Uh, and you can see those other hills dotted through. That's probably what most of this area would like, look like. Unfortunately, now that's all Bermuda grass for the most part. I think there's a few climbing grass pastures in there too, but it's mostly Bermuda grass and all this diversity and structure for wildlife and excellent forage uh, from the native and plant materials are gone now. But Jason Singhurst, some of those views you may have seen at that time, looking up the slope, you can see all the little blue stem mixed in here with Florida Paspalum, lots of partridge pea uh, in here. And then, of course, when they talked about the grass as tall as the belly of a horse or a man on a saddle, um, this is that same remnant that we were here in October. And uh, I'm about five foot nine, five ten on a good day wearing, a, wearing my tall shoes. And you can see those seed heads are up over my shoulder. So you're five, five and a half foot tall across there. Um, as you look across some of that structure, just a giant stand of big blue stem enjoying last year's summer rainfall. So that's what we had. And most of that is now gone, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. There's estimated to be less than 1% of 1% of the historic Blackland Prairie, which would have covered about 13 million acres is left, uh, particularly in public protected areas. So we've got for sure, less than 13,000 acres under permanent protection. It's estimated that there are less than 30,000 acres in total that are left in various remnants, anywhere from as small as one to three acres. Uh, the biggest ones that I know of are 2,000 or so acres, and one of them is about to be covered by solar panels uh, in Northeast Texas. The Smiley Woodfin Prairie just got uh, leased out to become a solar farm, and it's one of the largest tall grass prairie remnants in the state. Uh, there was an article in the Washington Post about that recently. So what was the historic driver that kept these grassland systems going? Well, primarily it was occasional drought like we had in 2011 and unfortunately seemed to be entering now. Uh, grazing by large herbivores, primarily bison and uh, the Blackland Prairie area, later wild cattle and horses, uh, and those types of things would have been there <clears throat> even further back. These systems have been around for a few million years. You probably even could have had mastodons and mammoths in those same grassland systems, uh, along with longhorn bison and God knows what else from the from the uh, from the Pleistocene area uh, era, rather. And then fire. So whether that would have been set by dry lightning strikes, Native Americans, early settlers, those were the three primary things that were driving the plant communities and the animal species that were utilizing these habitats. Unfortunately, now those primary drivers are secondary drivers for the most part, except for grazing. Fire has largely been eliminated from the landscape. Drought, we largely have no control over, uh, but most of this area has been impacted by human development, either through plowing for uh, uh, row crop agriculture. So in this situation here, this was a chalky ridge and you can say they just dozed right, you know, plowed right through it, preparing it for planting. 
Um, here's some annual winter cereal grains in the background with the big blue stem clump here on the roadside ditch still hanging on where it's probably always been. Uh, you turn just a little bit to the west, that big blue stem clump is actually just here to the right of the screen and there's plowed ground and now it's got a bunch of hackberry trees invading this area. Uh, that probably excludes anything from a grassland that would like to be there. And so you got some silver blue stem hanging out here, but you've also got lots of old world blue stems and non-native invasives coming over. Or more typically now, you have a bunch of non-native cover next to a bunch of development. So this was this area here closer to there's a farm to market road over here is being broken into little half acre to two acre ranchettes. And there's going to be all these little houses, you know, 2000 square foot homes where they're going to put like eight miniature donkeys and uh, a couple of God knows what else out there to uh, uh, to hammer the little bit they have on, on their acreage to try to keep their Aggies and shit. Uh, and more rarely, you'll have somebody who turns and puts in a grassland restoration. So this here to the left uh, is a very isolated restoration project that we did. This is about a three-year-old restoration that you can see nice grass clumps there, switchgrass. There's some little blue, a lot of big blue out there as well. Uh, that's about 130 acres we did on that property through the Pastures for Upland Birds program that I helped manage with Parks and Wildlife. And so that's what it looked like three years previous. Um, and that's more typical of what you see of a lot of the blackland prairie, particularly those on prime farmland. And we do need those row crops, but uh, as land ownership change, there's more folks who are willing to get, turn it back into some of these native grasslands. And so con full conversions, plantings are very expensive. You're talking hundreds of dollars per acre uh, to get those done. Either it would be from spraying herbicides to eliminate the non-native vegetation that's there, uh, paying for a diverse native seed mix is not uh, inexpensive, and only those species that are commercially available or what you can plant. It becomes difficult on a large scale to get less available species, uh, some of which are very beneficial to plant, uh, but you just can't buy them commercially. So you either have to have somebody dedicated enough to hand collect, which I'm sure a lot of this group is, uh, or grow their own plugs and put them out there. Uh, but you're largely reduced to maybe a few dozen species at best. Uh, when you have to plant it yourself. So what we wanted to focus on is there's a lot more habitat that looks something like this. This is a, a site that my, uh, my fellow coworker, Jay Whiteside, who's a technical guidance biologist for this area just south of Dallas with Parks and Wildlife, he had been coming out here and working with this landowner on another, other portions of his property for a large period of time. They viewed this site and he recognized that there were lots of high value climax species out here. So he saw big blue stem, he saw Indian grass, he saw little blue stem, Cytos grama on the site, but it was like three, four leaves here and there, a seed head per 10 acres, those sorts of things, because it was being grazed continuously and heavily. And so we thought there's got to be a way, there's, there's way more of this type of land that is some mix of non-native, native, good stuff, bad stuff, that if we just are able to change the management, change the way that property is utilized, we can get a lot of those really good things that we want to express themselves in a way that be, may be a lot more cost effective than trying to kill it all and start completely over. That's the most expensive option, the most time consuming option, and usually only the most dedicated folks will do because uh, it doesn't make financial sense. You're not going to get your money back on it a lot of times. It's more about what you want your property to be and what you enjoy personally. And so we had, there's Jay Whiteside there, we had gone to a number of prairie conferences. This conference, this, this picture was taken in 2013 in Mississippi at the Southeastern Grassland Symposium. We were touring a beef farm uh, that Bar S Meats run where they were trying to reestablish a bunch of uh, uh, they had done a bunch of uh, CP33 projects with the NRCS um, and the FSA uh, to basically put in field borders around croplands to improve quail numbers because the owner of that, that beef company really liked to hunt quail from horseback. And so they had done this all around the edges and we got to thinking about different things and, and starting to exchange ideas with a lot of other professionals from other states and how they were doing things. And we came across patch burn grazing and I was largely introduced to this in two ways. One was through... Uh, the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska has an excellent science writer that some of y'all may have heard of, Chris Helzer. He's got an excellent book called Prairie Management in the Central U.S., which is a book that came out probably seven or eight years ago, that the concepts are applicable across most of the tall grass prairie regions of the U.S. 
uh, even into the midgrass and a little bit into the short grass prairies. But it's presented as a methodology that may or may not be useful for your situation. But if you're trying to promote plant diversity, heterogeneity of structure, which basically means uh, dispersal across a landscape of structure of different habitat types, uh, this may be a tool you could use in a cost-effective manager, uh, a cost-effective manner, rather than expensive fencing, um, rather than doing daily movements of cattle with high-intensity short-duration stocking. You simply burn it, the cattle are attracted to that zone while it's burned, and then the other areas should be rested. And so started reading about it, got a little interested. Then I looked at some publications from Oklahoma State and other places from Sam Fulador uh, and Dwayne Elmore and those kind of things. We thought maybe this is something we could do uh, to direct grazing pressure and see if we can get some of those plants to respond the way we want them to. So what's the goal of that? Basically, we wanted uh, a variety of habitat structures in close proximity. So here you have an intensively grazed area where the grass is very short. Uh, some forbs are nibbled on a little bit. So this is a species of, of pin steaming right here where they nipped off the tops. Uh, you got some shrubby cover that isn't eaten. Um, there's lots of annual forbs coming in there. There's some bare ground, which a lot of our ground nesting birds need at certain times. Uh, but then juxtaposed to that, you may have an area that hasn't been burned in a while. And because it hasn't, the cattle aren't as attracted. So you start getting things that look like this. You have a lot of perennial forbs popping up, a um, bunch more grass cover in the understory. So this may be good brood rearing cover, lots of seeds, lots of insects, lots of shade uh, during the midday sun for things to hide in. And it's right next to that really exposed area. So maybe that other area is really good for kill deer, uh, really good for uh, different lark spurs and things like that that like short grass. This may be good for things like dick sizzles and certain species of, of uh, other grassland birds. So, you know, and quail need all of those. Monarchs might like both as well. Maybe they need that really exposed area so milkweed can grow and they can find it easier, but then they, the adults need all these nectar sources in the ungrazed area uh, to propagate themselves and continue the life cycle. So when you have those in close proximity, you get interactions that you wouldn't uh, when they're all kind of similar over a big scale. And so, you're hoping for something like this. You're going to have maybe an area that was grazed last year and is now being rested, and you start getting some of this newer growth that's somewhere in between those two. And so you have heavily disturbed, not very disturbed, and something in between, uh, all in close juxtaposition across the landscape. So you can see here, you get interactions with burning and grazing that you don't get with burning alone or grazing alone. So it's hard to tell if you, you didn't know that in this photo, but this is that's the Platte River is that line of trees in the background here in central Nebraska. When we were there for the Patchburn Grazing Conference. Uh, both of these pastures were burned at the same time uh, in the early part of the growing season. If I remember right, I think he said it was February of that year that they burned them. The part on this side of the fence was grazed. The other side wasn't. If you look at the plant diversity in this photo, you can easily pick out 10 to 12 different leaf structures out there on the grazed portion. And then on the other side, it's pretty much a monoculture of big blue stem that responded where it wasn't grazed. So while deer and other things may hide in here, they're going to come out here to eat. Um, while a quail may go in there to nest, they're going to come out here probably to find insects and find seeds on this bare ground. And so those juxtaposition of those habitat types from a wildlife standpoint is very beneficial. So what is patch burn grazing? Basically, you use fire at different times and scales to shift grazing pressure. That's the hope. And what does it accomplish? So we are allowing for production of quality livestock forage, because a lot of those plants respond well to fire, put on very nutritious and palatable new young growth. It can control woody encroachment if you're burning at the right times of year, <clears throat> and those species are fire susceptible, uh, particularly against cedar trees and things like that that aren't very susceptible to fire at all and don't re-sprout. It creates structural diversity in the vegetation, and it meets the needs of multiple wildlife species. So if you're doing this at the right times and the right scales, you can favor annual plants, biennials, perennials, um, as long as you're managing that grazing pressure correctly within the system. So here we're going to get into some sciencey stuff uh, that may be a little boring for some. I'm basically going to be reading the screen. I'm sorry. But grassland ecosystems are dependent on periodic disturbance for habitat maintenance. As a result, management of grassland areas is best directed towards the creation of a mosaic of grassland habitat types. This is if you're talking about managing for birds and not focus just on uh, monetary gain from uh, 
the amount of pounds of beef produced. So this habitat mosaic is probably best maintained through some type of rotational management system in which sections of large grassland areas receive management on a regular schedule. Such a rotational system would provide a variety of habitat types and every year would ensure the availability of suitable habitat for birds at either end of the grassland management spectrum. So those that like heavily disturbed, short vegetation systems and those like heavily thatched, well-rested, tall vegetative systems. Uh, and, and provide habitat for those birds whose preferences lie somewhere in between. So providing usable space is what we're after. So nesting, brood rearing, and screen rearing cover, they need those in close proximity. You're providing habitat patches in a single location rather than large blocks throughout, uh, throughout a block of habitat. You're providing bare ground for granivorous birds like morning doves. Uh, invertebrates are going to be more uh, available for, and then we're talking about insects and things like that. They're going to be using those. Sometimes they need sunny spots and sometimes they need shady spots. Some like tall vegetation, some like short vegetation, some like members of the sunflower family, some like members of the skullcap family, some like members of the milkweed family, and so on. So you'll find all those things spread throughout. So pollinators, you'll have generalists and specialists. Some are focused on those short-lived annual species, some are perennial, and they'll live in those stems over winter and come back. Some nest in the ground, so they need bare ground. You have short blooming species, long blooming species, diversity is the name of the game. And then the other thing is germination opportunities. So you're opening up with root and light space, root and light space, and there's less competition for those moisture and nutrients. And also within that, you're also giving pastures and areas of the pasture that aren't burned and aren't disturbed time to not have as much grazing pressure and be able to reproduce at least on it biennial or even uh, every three years as you burn through that based on what we use. It kind of depends on your burn section. So this illustration is from Chris Selzer. Basically it says if you've got an overgrown system, a monoculture of grass, you set back succession, open up light and root space for those things to come back. And now you've got more diversity as these annual plants or plants that can take advantage of disturbance pop in and fill those gaps. A really popular image that a lot of folks use about how you do that. So here, an ungrazed, undisturbed plant. You see that root mass as you reduce 50, each, each iteration is 50% of the above ground canopy cover removed. You can see the reduction in the root mass overall. So there's a couple of things to look at here. One is obviously there's gonna be more space uh, for other plants to compete with these. The other one is if you take too much of your grass in a continuous grazing system, your ability to infiltrate water, uh, improve soil structure, uh, lock in soil carbon, and recover when rains do return is greatly reduced. Uh, uh, easy saying for that is it you got to have grass to grow grass. Doesn't look like that much of a difference overall in cover from here to here, but you can see that difference of root mass uh, between these. So the useful usefulness of patch burn grazing as a tool. So in that traditional model, uh, which might optimize sustainable livestock production objectives, that might not be sufficient for the maintenance of plants and animals that require habitat, habitat conditions that are different from those uh, from moderate grazing activity. So by doing this, you can favor those who need heavily impacted areas and lightly impacted areas on the same habitat. So, and they need those in close proximity. So when we talked about quail as a primary example, uh, the ability of rangelands to provide habitat for wildlife and enhance biodiversity values will often depend on the ability of land managers to simultaneously optimize objectives associated with those values and objectives associated with livestock production. So, read a whole bunch of stuff there. If you're managing for this, the landowner that we were working with wanted to know, what's this mean for my cows? Am I still gonna be able to make money while I'm doing this or am I gonna have to greatly reduce my stocking rate? Past studies, I've got them listed there at the bottom uh, from Sam Fulledorf and others uh, found that in their management system, the way they graze things, they basically found that cow performance in those pastures managed with pasture burn grazing did not suffer or differ uh, in, a, uh, in a manner that was discernible uh, compared to traditional range management strategies. So those who adopt that pasture burn grazing system might be able to enhance or maintain the level of cattle performance they are accustomed to while also more greatly benefiting wildlife habitat objectives. So you take somebody who knows they can get the same amount of cattle and maybe they live in an area where they're in close proximity to a large urban center like Dallas and they can hunt wild quail 
Now you've got a secondary benefit and a secondary revenue source that they can depend on and still have the same level of cattle production, but now they may also be able to support more animals, uh, which can by and large also then support the ranching operation by having more dependable income than just cattle alone, if they're able to lease out hunting rights or, or so on. So the other thing patch burn grazing does, it reduces some of your fixed costs. So this, this is some a few years ago estimates. I'm sure it's more than that now as everything seems to have gone up. But uh, back then, 3 to $7 a foot, depending on if you were doing it yourself or paying somebody. So a five-strand barbed wire fence, quarter mile, your range of price anywhere from about $4,000 to $9,000. And then you have all the other fences age, posts rot, cattle lean against them and bust through them. Uh, trees fall on them. Wildlife can be affected by them if they're placed inefficiently or in a manner that's not conducive with their ability to cross through them and so on. And so the other benefit of burning is you can get some brush control. So you think about some of these species that are very spire susceptible, things like weasatch, honey locust, eastern red cedar, um, cedar elms or winged elms. Those are all things that you can get some semblance of control of where they don't, don't turn into trees and you lose some of your grazable acreage. Additionally, there's been some research that has shown there could be a reduction overall in parasites. So <clears throat> if you're moving these cattle and concentrating them in a certain area and you're dropping all these egg pets, maybe you can reduce the amount of horn flies because you're concentrating all that dung in one area. So what's going to be more attracted to that? Dung beetles. They'll be able to more efficiently harvest those pets in a single area than if they were spread across an entire 240 acre pasture. Um, it's kind of it's kind of like if I spread out, uh, you know, oh, let's just say some starburst across my yard, equally across the area, uh, it would probably be pretty inefficient. We're about to hit uh, Easter egg hunts here, so that's a pretty good example. But if I put starburst across my yard for the three kids to find and spread it out equally, it'd be pretty difficult. If I dump those starburst in one pile in a 10 by 10 square, I think they'll find them and get them all. And that's the same thing when you think about uh, cow pie, um, you know, getting worked over by those dung beetles and other things that are going to use them. If you concentrate them in one area, they should be eaten up. And maybe there's not as much of an ability for those things to be a problem. You could also burn up tick larvae, tick eggs, those types of things with these burns, uh, which can cause reductions in weight gain and so on. So stocking rate is an important consideration for this. The flexibility of your operation in case we hit a drought period and you don't get the response from the burn that you want, particularly as we enter areas that are more uh, arid. Uh, it becomes a bigger and bigger deal on it. can that area easily recover from the burn and produce the grass you need to respond in that way? Is this a scale for a single pasture? Can you do it on your entire property? And does your situation require more rest after the burn um, or even between the times that you burn it so things can recover? So you have to know some of your plants, know the response and be able to respond accordingly, which can be a little more difficult for some of those who are new landowners uh, are looking at other things. So stocking rate is going to, it's going to vary no matter what your grazing system, there is no magic number. It's going to vary on all these different things, your soil type, the rainfall, the year we're talking about, the vegetation on site, the vegetation you're managing before, you're trying to maximize the impact in the burn zone and minimize the impact outside of the burn zone to get the results we want. Rest is one of the most important components. So you need your perennial grasses to recover. This can be impacted by climate, as we said, long, so your rest period will be longer in dry cycles and shorter in wet cycles, and it's impacted by stocking rates. The heavier your grazing pressure, the probably the longer you'll have to rest it. So now we're finally getting into what we did, not just about what all we were planning for. So what you're looking at here is a map showing two different pastures. So this black hatched area from there to the east is our east pasture, and this yellow hatched area from there to the west is the west pasture. And so what we were trying to do is we ended up breaking these into different burn units. And so year one, we burned about this one third of the pasture in the east pasture and this one third in the west pasture along this creek. And we continued to go through and burn about a third of each pasture every year. So we burned as little as 60 acres, there are 240 acre pastures on either side. So we were burning as little as 60 acres to as much as 110 acres per burn basically depending on where the landowner put in his disc line as we were going through and putting these in. Um, if he angled off to the side a little bit, they got a little bigger. If he angled off to the other side a little bit, they got a little smaller. Uh, so, 
And this is right before we 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 burned the first time. It's actually actually the day of the burning. So you try to burn it here, and there was very little fuel scattered throughout this entire thing. It was grazed down to a nub across the area. It had actually rained quite a bit the previous year on this site, but the grazing pressure was just very high, and they were focusing it across the entire area, and it was just not getting much production. We had to drive four wheelers and walk across this thing over and over again to try to get it burned. It's a lot of unrecycled cow patties and everything else all throughout here. And so we looked at it, and looked at it, looked at it, and we looked at it, we looked at it some more, we looked at it some more, and after a hundred times of looking at it in these one by one meter square plots, using that floristic quality analysis, what we did was within those one by one meter plots, in order for us to get a hundred in per day, we went to, with the floristic quality analysis method, which basically is a methodology where all you do is look within that one by one meter plot and list every single species within it. Each of those species before you go out will already have a, a conservatism score. So something like annual, bro annual broomweed would be a one because you can find that on remnant prairies. You can also find it in an overgrazed pasture or sometimes even right next to a parking lot uh, next to a Dollar General in a small town. Uh, so it's not really indicative of a high-end, you know, uh, climax prairie that's never been disturbed. But you can look at other things like little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, which show that, hey, this is probably managed okay, at least periodically rested. And those would be something like fours to sevens, you know, somewhere there in that mid-range. Uh, you can find little blue stems sometimes in heavily grazed pastures, but it's usually more commonly found in areas that get a periodic rest. Big blue stem, even more so, areas that are managed well, better soils, uh, more intact soils, those types of things. And so what we were trying to do is take this from a more annual plant dominated community back to a more a perennial plant dominated community, both uh, forb and grass. And the ones that were there, we wanted to see more reproduction occurring and taller overall vegetation. So the first year we took some overall canopy height measurements, which after the second year we realized was kind of a worthless measurement uh, because we should have been measuring it by the species we cared about. Um, so eventually we just used a fertilizer quality method. We're basically just listing every species within that uh, meter by meter square. We've gotten as many as 27 species within one by one meter square. I think overall we're up over 177 species recorded on that 240 acre pasture. And we know we would get even more if we did more sampling in the early spring to catch more of those spring ephemerals. So <clears throat> here Jay is measuring with his mighty, with his mighty uh, grazing stick that we probably got from one of Ricky Lennox's uh, presentations from the NRCS here, or the Grazing Lands Coalition, uh, looking at different things and measuring those out. So getting a little closer there, midday through, and we do the sampling in July because we just like to suffer. So generally we're doing it between July 5th and July 15th. So we're catching the back end of some of the cool season plants, particularly in wetter years. Uh, and then some of the warm season plants are already starting to put on flower or seed. So they're a little easier to identify overall. So a couple of years on, Taylor Garrison there on the left is a new district bio with an excellent amount of, of wildlife and plant knowledge as well. And so he came out to start to help us as well. Uh, so we continued this patch burn grazing, burning a third of the time. The other benefit we got from this is we got more of the local landowners involved through uh, um, uh, the Western Navarro Bob White Restoration Initiative Group uh, to get out there and help us do these burns. And they were interested in what was happening and how things were going. But if you notice the difference in this photo from the first photo, this was three years later burning the same patch. If you noticed a lot of that vegetated cover is now almost knee to hip high. And instead of having to drive over it, we basically just lit the edges and it came all together. Uh, on its own, the fire was able to carry through. So we're starting to see more residual cover from being able to burn those small sections and focusing that grazing pressure. Plus, it's more fun, fun to always burn somebody else's property than your own when you're setting it on fire. Um, so here's Jay with the drip torch. You can see we had burned the pasture on the other side of the fence. So here we were burning the west pasture. That's the east pasture on the other side. Uh, and the cattle are already in there grazing it down just uh, about a week and a half after. It's already completely greened up. Uh, relative to this side that we had yet to burn. So basically, burn it. Uh, there's the, the burn when it's done. Cows are in there. This is two months later, and they're keeping that site grazed down and letting the rest of the land rest. 
So here you can see the difference between on the left, you'll see this is the fire break, kind of making a little wavy mark there between those mesquite trees as it goes down towards that pond. So burned on that side, unburned on that side. So you can see the difference in the residual plant community that's there. And so the grazing pressure should be focused more on this side. So there's Jason Singhurst and now retired Jan Jones and Jay looking at some of the different things. So we've got some cockleburr in this one, some, uh, I think there was some milkweed in there. Yeah, some milkweed in there and then lots of winter grass and other things. But uh, after that first year of sampling, that place was rougher than a cob. If y'all ever watched uh, uh, Lonesome Dove, we felt like old Pete after he got sent across the prairie. We were walking bow-legged and knee hobbled because that ground was all beat up from the years and years of, of heavy grazing that were there previously. And so um, this photo was taken about three or four years later, and it's just a completely different uh, system that was out there. Um, you know, lots more grass growing, a lot more water infiltration occurring. We weren't able to measure that uh, independently. I'll give some examples as to how I know that here in a little while, uh, but just a much different story. And now a lot of those, and then the landowner got more involved, and he started popping out all those mesquite trees on that prairie too, to where now there's only about five or six scattered across the entire thing uh, to open those up. So we're using those meter squared plots. We're listing all the species and we're trying to compare over time. Luckily for us, the Nature Conservancy of Te Texas had already just arrived conservatism values for North Central Texas, because they have a couple of preserves up there, particularly the Climber Meadow Preserve near Celeste, Texas. And so we were gonna try to make a long-term comparison of what was happening over time and then also try to compare the burned and the unburned plots. And we also have frequency data. So we could compare uh, the luster quality analysis scores between plots for the pastures overall, compare uh, frequency between burned and unburned pastures to see if we noticed a plant response between what was burned and unburned over time. And then also did certain plants increase or not over time. And so as we went through and did all this, here's our first, uh, first year's data. Mostly what was we found was low, low value species for the most part. So that first one, Desmanthus leptolobus, it shows a conservation coefficient of six. We've actually lowered that down to a two. Uh, I think they were trying to use Illinois bundle flower, and this is prairie bundle flower, which you kind of find, you even find it on rocky roadside pullouts and things like that. Uh, but it was, at first, it was found in 93%, 93 out of 100 plots, 100 out of 100 plots uh, on the West Pasture. And so it was really taking advantage of all the space because the grass was hammered. Uh, there's very little ab above ground growth. But here you can see some of the conservatism scores here on the right. So it's got the family, the species, uh, a Latin name and a common name here, uh, whether it's native uh, or exotic and then uh, where you find it, and then the conservatism score. So here, like uh, false aloe would be something like a 10 out of 10, just very, very high. Uh, Queen Anne's lace would be ranked at a negative two or a zero because it's an exotic species. Something like rattlesnake master would be rated like an eight on the frozen quality analysis because it's, it's pretty high up there as well. Uh, other things, if you think about bishop weed, that may be a three, polytenia and natale, so that's like, uh, not all is prairie parsley, that would be a five. You can find it on good prairies. You can find it in maybe areas that aren't quite as quite as well-placed, but just a good plant overall. So that's kind of how that rating system worked out. And so we went through and looked at all this. Uh, here's the east pasture comparison. So on the left-hand side, you can see in year one, we found that uh, prairie bundle flower on 93 out of 100 plots. In year two, it was found on 84 of 101 plots. And so we noticed a little bit of a reduction. And even now, I think we're down somewhere in the 50s or 60s. So as the perennial grasses have gotten stronger and filled in more space, uh, there's less areas for this to be able to take over. And the bigger thing we noticed is, even though we're still finding it in the plots, it probably makes up less than 10% cover overall as to where in the beginning, it was probably in some plots, it was almost 90%. Um, and so these things are gonna change over time as we go through here. Uh, based on the rainfall, temperatures for the year, all that sort of stuff. But we're getting a lot of this frequency data to fill out over time to let us know that is what we're doing being effective? Are we changing the plant community over time? And does it jive with what we're seeing visually? So other things besides what we found from a plant species response, we were finding way more insects after we started doing these burns. Um, 
you know, a lot more pollinators. We found our, we've started finding, after the first year, we found zero bird nests in the grass. Now it's not uncommon for us as we walk these transects, which aren't very wide, and we do these plots, we'll find as many as two to five bird nests in a given year across this area, because there's actually residual cover for those birds to nest in. So we found things like Indian blanket, uh, spreading bladder pod, uh, Maximilian sunflower, which we didn't see at all starting out. And so it took us till year three before we finally found one of these plants. The colony was actually growing before that. We could see where it had been, but we were never able to find it because it was grazed down to nothing. There were no leaves to even find it. And now we we're able to find that. So here you have Dahlia. This is either, uh, I think this is actually um, compact prairie clover rather than purpurea. Uh, both are on site, but uh, we found way more uh, purple prairie clover and compact prairie clover showing up. We're getting nine anther dahlia or dahlia uh, or big top dahlia, depending on where to stay. This is kind of more of a rolling plains, high plains type species. And it's kind of in a southeastern distribution over here in Ellis County. Uh, American basket flower becoming more robust and filling in its places, supporting lots of pollinators. Uh, and then we started getting before we would find big blue stem, we have to get down on our hands and knees and be like, OK, it's hairy at the base. The leaf blades are a little wider. I think this is big blue stem. And now every year we can see flowering seed heads coming up and emerging. You're like, OK, now we've got big pockets of big blue stem and these colonies are getting larger. So instead of a single clump, now we've got clumps that are 5, 10, 15, 20 feet across uh, that are becoming healthier and healthier because they've had the chance to rest, uh, replenish their root carbohydrates, be able to throw out seeds every couple of years um, as we focus that grazing pressure elsewhere. So here we've got lots of Cytos grama in the background growing mixed in with this. Uh, and before we knew it was Cytos grama, we could look at those leaf margins and see the hairs, but you would rarely see it seeding out. Now it's pretty much every time outside of the burn patch, particularly in the second year patch, you'll see Cytos grama responding very strongly, particularly if we get good June rains, uh, tossing out an abundance of seed. Uh, so we actually found switchgrass about five years later, just a few clumps here and there, but we're actually starting to find these things that we hadn't been documented in the previous five years. So I think the first year we documented 103 species. The next year we picked up about 25 more species we hadn't picked the first year. Next year we picked up another 20 species and we're still adding, adding you know, um, now I think the last couple of years we've added one to two species each year that still hadn't been picked up uh, in the first years. And so this will be our it's the seventh year, but the eighth year of sampling, if that makes sense. And we're still picking up new species. We'll be going out again this July. Uh, and we're also starting to see, you know, after a couple of burns, the little mesquites that weren't popped out by the landowner, uh, most of them have been top killed and they'll have these little, little uh, uh, re-sprouts from the roots, but we've knocked them way down from being eight, nine feet tall down to here maybe one to two feet. And then this was burned again the next year. So we're starting to see more and we're educating our base. So down here is Matt Mahachik, who now works for NRCS down at Corpus Christi, Jay Whiteside, botanical guidance biologist, Jason Singhurst, our botanist, Heidi Krieger, who works over in Van, Texas, in kind of that area east of Dallas along on I-20. This is a Parks and Wildlife intern, of course, be there, uh, also continue to learn. Uh, and then we saw no difference. I mean, these cattle are fat and happy. So the landowner was very pleased. Um, he reduced a little bit. Uh, he was able to reduce his, um, his supplemental feeding during the winter slightly. And so he, he estimated he was able to save about half a bale per cow that he had out there. So not a tremendous amount, but he estimated he was saving about an extra thousand dollars a year. Uh, and then some of his weights in the wetter years were a little higher for his uh, calves than they had in the past. And so if prices were up, then he was making a little better money in that regard too. But he noticed no detrimental effects and maybe a little better effect on his pocketbook marginally, as well as less, uh, uh, maybe a little less parasite loading on some of those animals as well. So he really enjoyed what was going on out there. And so we started seeing a lot more scenes like this, rather than that first show, photo I showed you at the beginning of this with pretty much all the vegetation all across 480 acres looking the same. Uh, we had tons of big blue stem. Here it's mixed in with snow on the prairie. This is year two after the burn in that particular patch. Uh, and so we had situations like this. So this was in Nebraska where they had burned and they let it be grazed for three years. And then they rested it where they burned it and then let it rest for two years and they had this response. Well, these are our pictures of that. So here, this was the burn unit. We had burned that, I think, in 
I want to say it was in February 2017, may have been early March. Um, but there's a tree in the background that'll stay the same. You can see the cattle are in the burn unit on this photo over four months later, after five months later, after we had burned it. And they had very little grass growth. Most of it's been grazed down, lots of Western ragweed. There's some uh, prairie agalinus or prairie petunia, uh, American basket flower growing in there. And you can see Jay's feet and you can see his uh, grazing pole right there, very little cover. So here I laid down that grazing rod. And you can see little grass cover, lots of forbs. So snow on the prairie, prairie petunia or prairie agalinus, single seed croton or prairie tea, um, American basket flower growing here. There's some dandelion seed heads there. And then lots of other diversity as you go through there, um, room weed starting, all sorts of things. So if I'm a quail chick, there should be lots of places where there's bugs and all these different plants that I can take advantage of. If there's seeds on the ground, I'm able to find them. Here's a spot that was hit even harder within that. So you can see there's the grass plants. They're all pretty much clipped off from being burned. But there's no fences. We added no fencing. The only difference is the next two years, we burned other patches. So now this has not been burned in three growing seasons. And this is the recovery by burning the other places. So same time of year, much more grass cover. These are big blue stem seed heads emerging. If you, there's that same tree in the background, and now you can't even see Jay's knees uh, compared to when you could see his shoes while ago. And so here you look, here we are in mid-July and the grass growth is over 20 inches, even though the cows are in the pasture. They're in the pasture at this point, they're just focused on that burned area. And so we're seeing re reproduction by the existing plants, we're filling in of that space, much more plant diversity. You can see American basket flower, Indian blanket, and other things filling in those spaces. And just a completely different area where we've been able to focus that over time. So now you look at that right across the ground, you can barely see into there. So maybe you got some good quail nesting cover there. Uh, so here's a burned area, 2018 that was burned. You can see they're basically completely slicked off, lots of bare ground. Um, again, this is some things we'll select for this. You can see all those dead mesquites I was telling you about that the landowner went out there and plucked out from when we started back in 2015. So now it's really starting to look like a prairie out there. And we're still finding new species. This was in 2020, it's Jason Singhurst and Heidi again. We came across a pitcher sage. Uh, it's growing right there. And this is a big colony of big blue stem running down this hillside. And some um, ironweed growing in the back. When we started right here, that first photo where it showed you the burned and unburned burned portion with Jay, Dan Jones, and, and uh, Jason in there with me was right back over here. So now you can see we removed most of these cedars. A lot of them are top killed. And then beyond that, this used to be just a few patches of big blue stem in here, which may or may not fall within our, our plots. Now this is extending down the hill, running down a little depression that's in there, almost 20 yards, and it's getting wider towards the base as it flattens out. So we're seeing those perennial grasses expand, and now we've got vertical cover, and now we've got more wildlife using it. Um, just a very big difference. And so for us, what we're trying to get out of all of this is we want to continue to get continued research. And so uh, the thing that happens with most research project, projects is you either have a master's candidate or a doctoral PhD candidate, doctoral candidate. And so you'll get two, three, four years of data and that's it. And a lot of times the full effects of your efforts aren't reflected uh, until much longer after that. If it took two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 decades to destroy a system, it's Foolish to think that you'll see the full effects of restoration within the first one to four years. So continued long-term management and doing the right thing, you'll continue to see those benefits for a long period of time. And so one of the great things about this is we've now been tracking this site for seven years, which is eight growing season, and we can plan on continuing to do it for a full 10. So when we're done, we'll be able to compile all this data. We're still not making it jumping to any conclusions that this is the end all be all. Uh, for the right things to do. What we're saying is this worked here. Uh, we saw the response that we liked from a structural standpoint, from a response from the climax prairie species that the floristic quality analysis that was available to us show as species that are uh, perennials and indicative of high quality prairie. And we were able to not spend much money. Um, basically we helped the landowner do this. All he did was put in the fire breaks and we burned it. If you had to pay somebody to do that, uh, you may have been spending $1,000 per year. If we had divided this pasture, uh, maybe a little bit more than that now, uh, depending on the size that you would have to burn. But 
still relative to building a permanent fence that would require maintenance uh, and other such things, the cost over time was equivalent to putting in two cross fences across this entire pasture. Uh, and that would have been <clears throat> for those 10 years, not including maintenance, follow-up, loss, uh, uh, other losses and things like that that occur when you build long-term infrastructure. So we'll continue to evaluate the data sheets and hope to release additional evaluation data over the next few years about the results. Uh, during this time, I changed jobs and I had much less time to uh, enter in and uh, analyze the data. So hopefully I'll be able to enter in a lot more of this data and get it analyzed here over the next couple of years and be able to get an intern. But we plan on continuing the research for at least two more years to finish the three burn cycles and sampling cycles for all treatment pastures and analyze those results. So what does that mean? Patch burn grazing is another tool in the toolbox. It can achieve effects of fi that fire and grazing cannot alone. It also helped us on this particular place achieve secondary goals. We had better brush control, parasite control. We minimize our fire risk because we're reducing the fuel loading on at least a third of the pasture each year. We're promoting biodiversity. We're seeing insect response, bird response, mammal responses on these sites because there's different habitat types in close proximity. We're increasing usable space for the species that are that were already there and are there. And cattle production has stayed relatively flat or even increased a little bit relative to what was there previously. So the end result for us that we're interested in as Parks and Wildlife is we've also seen more wildlife in the field. We've jumped quail out of those pastures where they were rarely seen before. We've seen an increase in almost all other classes of wildlife that were out there. So using that floristic quality analysis system has allowed us to put numbers to those visual things that we have seen. And so the ability to do that comes from having enough knowledge of the local flora to know what is to be expected on the geology of your area, the, which usually serves as the plant material for the different sorts of parent material for the various soils that you have. And then if you're in close proximity, you may uh, of different geologic types or eco regions, you need to make sure you know which one you're in when you make those rankings. So what we used from the Nature Conservancy was information from three different botanists and two different range specialists who had over two decades, three decades of experience in North Central Texas when they wrote it. We verified that information. A difficult thing we've come across is that you will run into species that aren't ranked. And so then you've got to figure out that ranking yourself. And so uh, that was like I told you, we changed that one from a six to a two because we went with one guy's interpretation of the six. And we're like, man, I'm seeing this stuff in some really raggedy areas. I think six is pretty high. Uh, because the reason we made that west pasture and east pasture comparison was the east pasture was still predominantly about 75 to 80 percent native plants. There was some King Ranch Bluestem in there. The west pasture was primarily 90 percent King Ranch Bluestem, and we wanted to see if there's any more or less, et cetera, as we move through. Uh, and so you've got to have some really good plant experts to start with that ranking system and the list of species. But once established, it can be, become a really effective tool for uh, plant communities in the same ecoregion. If you're trying to do conservation planning as an organization, you can rank those, those areas and say, okay, which one do we prioritize? Which one has the most unique species, the highest value species, is more indicative of that particular area with the limited amount of funding we have to protect it, or which one gets the management this year? Which one's going to suffer more if we don't do treatments? Are we determining, are we seeing more exotic invasives in one than the other? Uh, but if the one with a lot of exotic invasives had a lot of low value plants, then maybe you protect the other one because it's the one that's in greater distress of becoming of less value. So with that, uh, we'll go through some of the questions. But, uh, you know, Mr. Beeson, the landowner, Jay Whiteside, Taylor Garrison, Heidi Krieger, Bobby Alcorn, Matt Mahachik, Dan Jones, Charlie Booher, Obed Rodriguez, Jason Seahurst, and all the Wimbry landowners and volunteers that helped me with this. Couldn't have done it without them. Uh, it was a lot of effort outside of our normal job responsibilities, but it's something we've really enjoyed seeing over time. And uh, nothing beats time in the field to learn these plants in all their various stages. I'm sure y'all are all familiar with getting down on your hands and knees and examining two little uh, seed leaves and maybe one true leaflet and trying to figure out what it is. And it's amazing how after you see them for seven years, you, you can have one true leaf and be like, oh yeah, that's you know, that's a basket flower coming up. It's just not very far along yet, those sorts of things. So um, with that, 
I'll take it to the chat and uh, Bill, if you've got anything to say or or have questions, yeah. let's, let's go for it. Yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's look at some of these questions. Uh, Ricky uh, has a question that I was wondering about too, which is, uh, how did you decide where the one meter frames were uh, placed? That's a great question, Ricky. So uh, with ours, some people put fixed fixed plots that they come back to every year. We one couldn't do that because this is a working pasture, and we knew we were going to lose those plots. Uh, if we put in pin flags, we knew cattle were going to, or deer or whatever else, we're going to mess with those pin flags. And we weren't going to knock in T uh, posts or uh, rebar everywhere because we didn't want to impact the use of, of equipment in the, in the pasture either. And so what we do is we do uh, the methodology that Chris Helzer used, which he describes. I had a link to it in the, here in the presentation. I'll see if I can go back to it real quick. Um, but uh, when we do that, his is a plot-wise floristic quality analysis, so he does actual plots. Other people just walk through it and get a plant list for the entire property and call that their score. Uh, but when we did ours, there you go, there's a link right there that goes into big description of, of what he did. Um, essentially, we go to a corner. Uh, we try to change the corner every year. Uh, and we have a random number sheet or a random number generator. Uh, and we have a, a grid on chain. So for the, Jay and I both went to SFA and got some forestry training. And so chain is 66 feet. And so 10 square chains makes an acre. And so it's a 240 acre pasture. And we knew we wanted a uh, hundred plots. So we made a six by four grid. So uh, six chains between sampling uh, transects and four chains between plots. And so we generate that random number. That's our first distances off the fence lines. And then we run a, a azimuth <clears throat> that's shot off the fence line. And we do a plot every four chains off of that and then six chains between the plots. And that's how we get our 100 plots for each side. So there uh, would be a random stratified uh, would, would be the methodology that we use for those. So. We sample slightly different areas within the plots over time, but the beauty of that is they're all geolocated. And so I'm hope we've got a we're gonna have this huge data set then we're done that somebody could analyze in nine, 10 different ways uh, over time to check, see the differences between soil types, see the difference between slope aspects, see the difference between burned and unburned uh, over time. But random stratified is how we did that. Um, so we're not measuring the exact same location each time because we didn't want to trample them down. You start getting some effects on those things, in my feeling, when you have sampling that takes over that long period of time. Here's a question. Uh, I'm not sure I know what this means. Maybe you do, but Becky is asking, uh, where is your 130-acre restoration three years old from row crops? Oh, okay. So that, that's actually a six-year-old restoration now. So it was planted in 2015. But uh, uh, that one's in Falls County down near... Um, now, the nearest town would be Zabchikville, which uh, kind of local landmark over there is Green Sausage House. I recommend if you ever go east of Temple on FN 53, you stop at Green Sausage House. It's a great little spot. Uh, but uh, uh, that, that's where that one is, is right over there um, along FN 53, just inside Falls County. And so uh, that pasture shrub and birds program that I run, uh, we've restored now. Oh, this year, I think we planted a little over 1,400 acres back to native grasses. Um, next year, we've got a little over 2,000 acres that we'll be planting. And so uh, the biggest one we've done, I think, is 385 acres in one block. Uh, we've done multiples. Where we've done 50-acre projects and put them all together, and it came up to like 200 or so. Uh, but minimum acreage size that we try to do is 25 acres. Uh, typical projects, probably somewhere between 40 and 70 uh, that we do for those. But there's quite a few scattered around. Uh, throughout the post oak savannah, a little bit in piney woods, uh, blackland prairie, and we've expanded recently into the rolling plains, cross timbers, and even up into the panhandle. And so those we're starting to get more and more projects up in those areas as well. The problem we're having is getting enough funding to <laughs> to fund all those projects. Um, and Catherine asks, uh, are you finding a decrease in invasive and undesirable vegetation? Uh, overall, for the most part, the biggest uh, so King Ranch blue stem was the most dominant, uh, undesirable non-native vegetation species that was out there. 
it's basically stayed the same. So we, depending on the year, we, the first year I think we sampled, we had 20, it showed up in 25 of 100 plots in the East Pasture. Um, and I think the highest year it showed up in 43. And we've basically been in that 25 to 40% number. But the thing that we have found is as to where when we first started, um, there were basically these grazing lawns that were only King Ranch blue stem. Now there'll be there's more divert, so there's still less diversity than where it's only natives, but there's more diversity in those plots. It went from like two to four species up to like six to ten, depending, because we're opening up more space for those things to germinate and infiltrate those, uh, you know, that that thatch, that uh, little grazing lawn that King Ranch Blue Stem can make. And we've also made that King Ranch Blue Stem grow more upright. It's not spreading and making this mat the way it used to. It's starting to grow more upright. So I'm not saying King Ranch Blue Stem is a good thing by any stretch. I hate the stuff uh, from a wildlife perspective. But if you can manage that habitat structure, because you're never going to eliminate it once it's in there, you don't want to get rid of all the good stuff to eliminate it. But if you can manage its structure, you can at least uh, minimize its detrimental impacts relative to what it was previously. Uh, so I'd say overall, most of them are holding steady. We haven't seen an increase. Uh, we haven't really, you know, like Johnson grass, we find it in maybe one plot a year. Uh, Bermuda grass, we only find where he feeds hay, which is one, one location. Uh, so we're mainly seeing an increase in the health and robustness of the, uh, of the native plant community as to how this is being managed. Uh, where can a person find a list of plants with their number value? Uh, you know, that's going to be, like I said, it's, it's equal region dependent. So if, if I gave you all a list for the North Central Blackland Prairie, some of those may be analogous to what it would be for the Western cross timbers and others would be completely off base and not really representative at all. So a lot of times if there isn't one, you have to work with a group of professionals to try to develop one or what you know should be found in those areas. Uh, and that's sometimes the hardest thing is finding those, uh, those historic climax remnant communities to really give you an idea of what should be there and what should be ranked really high versus what's really common and can kind of be found anywhere. So some of the species are really easy, some are sort of hard to rank. And again, like I said, if you start to, to really go out and do this on a lot of properties, uh, you're gonna run into species you didn't rank. And so then, you know, the ranking system it's not like, it's basically a consensus of professionals. You know, it's not really an official, oh, you know, false aloe rated 10. So it's way better than broomweed. You know, it's all relative. It, 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 what it indicates is that <coughs> false aloe is probably only going to be found on the best of the best sites. You know, lack of soil disturbance, uh, periodic rest periods, not sprayed with chemicals, um, all those kind of things. And Catherine was wondering about... Uh the effect of the availability of water? Ah, that's an excellent question, Catherine, and one that I, that I talked about in the December study and I forgot to mention in this one, so I'm glad you brought it up. So uh, let me go back to the, uh, the, I've got a photo, that aerial photo of the pasture as we go through. So two things that we found from our experience with this is, so you can see there's a, there's a pond here, there, this is an east pasture, there's a pond here, Pond here, pond here, pond here. So there's only four ponds across the entire pasture. So well, before we started burning, you would see these cattle concentrate. There's also a barn right here. In the heat of the summer, the cattle would concentrate around this barn, around this water, this water, this water, and this one big elm tree right there. They'd concentrate under those. So as the summer got on and the days got hotter, water and shade became more important than the fresh green growth of this burn. But we were still getting almost five to six months of rest for these areas before that. So that was really important. So water distribution was fairly even. On this pasture, there's a pond here. There's a pond here. Um, there's also a water source. This creek will hold water that they'll use as well. But water is not well distributed. One of the best examples I can get from when we burned, you can kind of see this old cow trail right there. The first time we burned this, there was so little fuel on this side of that pond, we could not get it to burn. So we actually, we didn't use the fire break that was here. We used this cow trail, which was only about two feet wide as our fire break and the fire couldn't cross it. 
it was so overgrazed. Uh, and so we were able to burn that portion. We burned this portion this year and we had a giant smoke column. The grass was knee deep across it. I mean, it's just a night and day difference from being able to get some rest out there. Of course, all the rain last summer certainly helped with that, uh, but it made a huge difference in being able to rest it. So the other thing that we found was I mentioned when we walked across it the first time, that ground was so hard to walk across and water infiltration was so poor. Um, it had gotten really wet in the spring of 2015. So there were hoof prints and foot, foot hoof in, indentations across the entire pasture. And so it was like walking across the surface of the moon kind of thing where, you know, every part of your foot was hitting a different level, uh, hit a different point of impact. Well, now the water infiltration has gotten so much better that the landowner actually dug out, dug out all four of his ponds because they're no longer getting enough runoff to fill up off of the rain events that he's getting. It's all going into the soil. And so this last year when we went out there to sample, it had rained two and a half inches. So the, the first year we sampled, they had had a six inch rain a month before we got out there and then maybe a half inch here or there to kind of keep things green. And it was still slick in spots. There were standing water in spots where it hadn't infiltrated and we had all those troubles with all the indentations. This time, like I said, they, I think it was a two or two and a half inch rain just a few days before we got out there and there wasn't a puddle across the entire pasture. It had all gone in. Uh, we were able to drive our trucks across because uh, um, it was soaking into the soil. The infiltration rates had gone so high. We very much wished that we had had the foresight to see that this would happen to have test what the infiltration rates were, done some soil testing to see infiltration rates. Did we have effect on soil carbon? Uh, did we have an effect on, uh, you know, uh, was there a hard pan previously? All those kind of things. But unfortunately, we did not. It's all been, all been you know, sort of what we've observed. But he's had to enlarge these ponds because runoff has decreased from the additional vegetative cover and the additional infiltration into the soil. And so an interesting thing about that as well is that during the dry times, we've noticed his property, when it's really wet, he'll dry out sooner. And when it's really dry, he's staying greener for about two to three weeks than his surrounding neighbors uh, because of the shading of the vegetation or the soil is cooler from the additional shading of the standing vegetation and the higher infiltration rates. And the soil is acting more like a sponge than it's more than a watershed. You know, it's not a, it's actually soaking it up and storing it for use. So thank you for asking that question, Catherine. That's, that's, I'd say beyond the structure and the benefit we've seen for birds, that's one of the most amazing things to Jay and I is the difference in water availability for the plants and the difference in uh, soil runoff um, after in the rested areas, especially. Are conservation scores available for any other areas? Uh, say that one more time. Conservation scores, are, are they available in any other uh, regions? I believe there's another uh, uh, model for this used down on the Texas Gulf Coast. Um, some, most of the time where folks have used it, there's a lot in the Midwest. And it's unfortunate to say this, uh, but after going to a lot of conferences in other states, I feel like in some of these methodologies for uh, monitoring some of these sites, not that we're behind, but maybe it just hasn't been adapted as much by some of the various groups that are out there. A lot of the other states that are doing this have uh, had more similar uh, eco-regions across the state, so it makes it a lot easier uh, if you do one for one part of the state, you can basically do a third of it. You know, if you think about y'all's location there in the Western Cross Timbers, if you go 40 miles in any direction, you're almost in a different eco region, you know, with a different plant community, different soil type, uh, that sort of stuff. You can be in the Grand Prairie, you can be in the Cross Timbers, and you can be in the Rolling Plains, and just a few hop leaps and bounds here and there. Or you can be in limestone uh, country, or you can be in sandstone country and have completely different plant communities. And so a lot of other places don't have some of those uh, limitations, you may call it from a sampling standpoint, but it's really a blessing from a diversity standpoint of what all we get to see in our parts of Texas. Uh, so I would say that they're fairly limited to my knowledge, but if you ask around, you may be able to find some that folks have used, but they're probably not highly refined. Uh, so uh, I know Ricky Lennox is retired now, so maybe that's something he could get going for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Uh, 
One more question here I got uh, from Joseph, uh, something that I think a number of people would like to know. Uh, any advice on eliminating Bermuda grass? Uh, the best advice I can get you for, on, for eliminating Bermuda grass is that to know that uh, one application will never get the job done. Bermuda grass is a very aggressive uh, plant. If there's any soil moisture, it'll probably persist. Uh, even in pastures that we've sprayed multiple times, typically in low areas, it'll still persist on some lower level. Uh, so be ready to spot spray anywhere that your boom sprayer can't go, uh, those types of things. If you've got, you know, it depends what size you're talking about. If you're talking about something the size of a wildscape or pocket prairie in your lot or living area, you may be able to solderize it or do things to kill, kill that. But if you've ever had flower beds where you killed it in the flower bed and left it just outside, it'll creep back in after a few years uh, pretty effectively. But the strategy that I use with our Pastures for Upland Birds program is we typically spray once in the early growing season, typically after the nights are very often over 65 degrees on a regular basis. The soil temperatures you want at least 65 to 70 degrees. Um, for us here down in College Station, that's usually in some years as early as May 15th, more typically after June 1st is when those start to occur. And so I would say that June 1st to June 15th timeframe is when we look to spray the first time. We spray at a heavy rate, a labeled rate uh, for the 48% glyphosate that we're using is three to 3.3 quarts per acre. Uh, so since I know I'm going to spray twice, I spray at three quarts per acre to save a little bit of money, especially if y'all don't know, glyphosate has basically doubled in price this year from just 18 months ago. Uh, so I used to pay about $22 a gallon for the five gallon cardboard jugs or two, two and a half gallon jugs. Right now, they're quoting me anywhere from $35 to $55 a gallon, depending on the product, uh, with limited availability as well. So it's, the price has gone way up. Uh, then I follow that up with a fall spraying uh, prior to the, you know, at least four to six weeks before the first freeze or first frost. And so you basically hit it once when it starts to get going, and then you hit it again in the fall to not let it fix any root carbohydrates or be in good shape going into the winter and then you'll kill it and it won't have time to respond before we get a frost or a freeze. Uh, and so then all you have to worry about is what other cool season competition you get. Because usually once you kill all the warm season competition, you get a lot of cool season competition in our part of the world down here in College Station. That could be annual ryegrass. Uh, the other day I was out at a place that had a bunch of multi star thistles show up off the highway that was invading. Uh, you can get musk thistle, burr clover, or black medic. Uh, Oh, Japanese brome is a big problem uh, in a lot of places. Uh, six weeks rescue grass, all those kinds of things that can pop up. But a really light application of one quart is what I use on those. Uh, those winter annuals burn down really easily. And then I plant seven to 14 days after that is what I try to shoot for uh, if the soil conditions are right and the weather cooperates. Uh, so usually two applications in the summer on Bermuda grass and you can spot spray in between if you Anytime somebody sprays, they'll usually miss swaths or miss areas around trees or in corners. So you need to clean those up because Bermuda grass can spread really far, really fast, which with whatever you miss. So that's my primary goal when I try to kill it. So pretty long explanation there, but basically spray early, spray late, spray often, uh, and try not to miss anything is the best way to do it because it's highly aggressive. Well, thanks so much, uh, Tim. This has been a really great presentation. I really appreciate your uh, talking to us. Thanks so much for having me.